This is Lynn Fraser. I'm delighted to be here with Scott Killaby again as part of the Radical Recovery Summit series. And today we're going to talk about fraud in the addiction recovery field. I'm going to post an article for you to read about, about fraud in the addiction recovery field. And I was quite shocked, actually, to see the extent of it. Some of it is misrepresentation. Some of it is outright fraud. And so, Scott, why don't you go ahead and kind of introduce us to this and, and let us know about the magnitude of this problem and how it's affecting addiction recovery. Oh, thanks, Lynn. It's actually a really big problem. And I think a lot of people are unaware of it. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the public is becoming aware of it more and more because we're having these articles come out. We're having these like 2020 Dateline shows that are starting to talk about it. People are becoming more aware. I certainly don't think that people have any idea how widespread it is. Even if they're aware of it, they're not aware of how widespread it is. And I think there's a lot of like negative things that are happening as a result of that. And one is that the good guys are being pushed out. <laughs> That's one of the issues is that it's unfair competition when someone engages in fraud. So those who are trying to abide by the law and the ethics, um, it, they can't compete in the same way with those folks. So we're actually, we're squeezing out the good guys and, and the bad guys are making a lot of money. So you know, this is why I'm on the side of let's get rid of this. Let's fix this issue because it's going to hurt the patients. It's already hurting the patients. So you are part of two organizations that are working to uh, address fraud in the addiction recovery field. And maybe before we even get into that, could you just say why you got into the field of addiction recovery? Oh, well, because I was for 20 years really active in addiction myself. And then through the process that you and I have talked about so often, inquiry, awareness, um, I just experienced a profound like shift around so many things that I've been addicted to. Um, wasn't all at once that shift, but it unfolded. And as I started to realize that I was, well, I was, I was already a teacher at that point, and I was already sharing about awareness, but I hadn't talked about it in terms of addiction. So I really wanted to start talking about it. And then as I started to talk about it, people started to come up to me and say, why not open a treatment center and just do it? So we did five years ago. Five years ago. So what are some of the, some of the big things that you learned over the last five years about addiction recovery? Oh my gosh. It's been a very, very big learning um, experience. From the first time that I sat down to try to understand how to do all of this, how do you run a treatment center? Being an attorney, it was kind of fun to research it and to figure out what the law is and how do you run a center. But a lot of it is just sort of stumbling upon an issue and then how do you take care of that issue and then you learn from that and then you build that into your procedures. So after five years now, we have a really robust set of procedures that protect us and that allow us to follow the law and the ethics in every way. But that came about through frankly, countless hours of legal research on my part at night uh, while the center was open. Um, so the first year was spent doing a lot of research. And I think that's one of the reasons that there's sort of different buckets of fraud in this industry. And I'll explain that in a second. But one of the buckets is people who just don't know the law. They don't have a bad intention. They don't have the money as a treatment center owner to hire an attorney for every issue. So they're continuing to make mistakes, really. What I've done is to try to find out those areas that people are making mistakes in and correct those on my end. And, you know, and I do feel sorry for those folks who don't have access to the, to the legal part of this. That's a, that's a problem, too, access, so that people can be educated about how not to make mistakes, not just how not to intentionally engage in fraud, but how not to make mistakes that are fraudulent in a way. So um, I know that our topic today isn't what you do at the Killaby Center, but I would like to encourage people to go to the recent interview that we did about new methods of treatment and recovery, because a lot of the, a lot of the, method that, the methods that you use at the center are innovative, they're mindfulness-based, they work with trauma first, and it would really help people to understand more about that if they watched that other interview. So I'll put the link for that up here too. Thanks for that plug, Lynn. So let's get into the fraud. So when did you start to notice it? What, what are the main components that you're seeing? Well, when I first started to notice it was, I sat down as CEO of my company 
And I started to ask questions about how do you do this and how is this done? And I was relying on people in the industry giving me answers, but some of the answers didn't feel right. It was just that sort of intuitive sense that I need to do some additional research on this issue. What I learned is I need to do research on every issue because there's so much, I don't know how to say it. It's not just fraud. It's just people making mistakes and continuing to make mistakes. So I first learned that that's the situation here, that you can't even rely on information within this field to get this right. You have to do your own um, research on it. And that's, so I don't remember the second part of your question, but that's when I first discovered it literally was when we opened. Okay. And you've been involved with these two organizations for the last few years. So obviously you've been concerned about the fraud for a while. So you've known about it um, a bit ahead of the general public who we're really just learning about it more now. Right. So what, what are the main things that you're seeing? Uh, and we've got an article here that we're going to queue up for people as well. Um, do you want to start going through some of those or do you want to give an, a general introduction to it first, maybe? Yeah, a general introduction is, let's just talk about sort of the three buckets of treatment centers. You know, it's hard to put anybody in categories, but if you can understand it this way, you can see how the fraud happened and how it continues to happen. So on one, in one bucket are just the, the folks who are, are trying very hard to do it right. They're working with their attorneys. They make mistakes, but they correct those mistakes. They're very conscientious and ethical. And that group is being pushed out because there's just unfair competition when you're doing good things. I mean, I've talked to these folks and they're having trouble just like we are keeping up with all of this stuff that's going on in other centers. Um, so that's one bucket is sort of the good guys. Um, and then the ones that are made, the ones that are engaging in fraud kind of fall into two different buckets. There's one is just the people that are really almost intentionally doing it. Like they know it's illegal and they're just doing it anyway, even while, <laughs> Even while law enforcement is here investigating, they continue to do it. So, yes, it's true. Um, and then the third bucket are people who are not intentionally engaging in fraud, but they're misinformed about the law. And so they're running treatment centers and making mistakes, not catching those mistakes. Those mistakes end up being profitable sometimes for them. Um, so they don't look into it. Um, and it's costing insurance companies a lot of money. And that has a backlash that is bad for the patients because their premiums go up, everything goes up for them. So it's, it's a systematic problem, actually. The law enforcement are mostly going after the second group? And certainly they're going after the ones that are intentionally doing things. However, they're trying to clean up the, the other bucket too, just to, to say, look, you can't use ignorance of the law as a defense. It's not a defense. You have to learn how to do this right. So they're probably going to go after both buckets, but more aggressively after the intentional actors. So can you say a little bit about the scope? I read in, in that article, $58 million in fraud with one center. That's a lot of money. Yeah. So that's an extreme case, right? On the spectrum of fraud, you know, the extreme is this millions of dollars being built out of an insurance or insurance companies. Um, and then you have the full spectrum there. So, you know, a center might be somewhere in the middle billing a few million in fraudulent charges, not 58 million. And then of course, as you move through the spectrum, people are more ethical and they're billing for the services they actually provide. And that's the full spectrum of it. But yeah, so it's not like the, Every sinner who's doing bad is billing 58 million. Right. But some of, some of them are uh, at those numbers. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the ways that they do that? Well, so that's the article that, that we're going to show everybody. And this is from, I'm going to put my glasses on here. This is from the Recovery Research Institute. I don't know a lot about this institute. I like this site because it, it's really trying to educate the public. It's very simple terms of educating the public. So as we go to this article, um, and you're going to post the link, we can just go through the various kinds of fraud so that you can be aware of how it's happening. The first one is patient brokering, and this is probably the most common one, I would say, and it's certainly the one that was investigated in Florida quite a lot. It's being investigated in other states now. Patient brokering is just like it sounds. It's like 
a treatment center is paying money to somebody in order to get a referral or calls that are directed you know, to them. Um, or it's someone out there doing that and being paid by a treatment center. So it's the transaction works both ways. It's fraud from either end, whether you're receiving or giving. Um, but it's not just like paying for a patient. That happens actually. So treatment center pays $8,000 and they get a client from an outreach person that's out there somewhere. Um, but it's also, there's some more specific examples and it talks about it in this article where their call centers are set up to generate commission based on the number of placed referrals with call center agents posing as caregivers and unbeknownst to the patient, auctioning off the patient to the highest bidding treatment center. So that can be going on while you, you think you're on the phone with a caring person who's just concerned and who's on the up and up. There could be things going on in the background that you're not aware of in terms of how they're filtering those calls and who's paying for you, who's buying you in a sense. How do you, how do you get behind this? Is that you have to really do your research about the center that you're going to. Yeah, you just really have to in order to, to make sure that they're not, they're not buying you in some way. Frankly. So when somebody calls the Killaby Center, they talk to somebody from the Killaby Center. They're not being routed off to a call center. Right. Well, we don't do call centers. Right. But that's for this reason. We just don't do. Right. So you're always talking to a Killaby Center. And sometimes it's me, but usually it's a, a, a admissions coordinator. Right. Mm -hmm. Right here with us. Right. Right. Yeah. And so then patient enticement, that sounds like a little bit like a bribe. So yeah. centers offer free flights, free, what, what kind of things do they offer people to come to their center? Um, I want to back up and talk about sort of what I call the wild, wild west out here when I first got, that's what I was calling it. It was like, it felt like this, this field was so unregulated. It was like the wild, wild west. And it was just so in California. So it fit the metaphor. Um, the reason I say that is because this was actually a common practice five years ago, or even two years ago, where treatment centers were paying for things. They weren't giving money to anybody like paper money, but they were paying. So it's not uncommon for someone in Idaho to seek treatment in California and the treatment center would pay for their flight. Now, so that on some level, that sounds like a really nice thing. But the problem is, is that it entices patients to go to your center, so monetarily enticing them. And that's not the proper enticement. It should be based on the care that you're getting whether it fits your, what you need, not on whether the, the center will buy you a ticket. Um, if a center will buy you a ticket, there are some cases in which there's a legitimate scholarship. So a person cannot afford these things and the treatment center will just do that, not, not in a routine way, but just in a single case every now and then to help someone out. But they and they'll fully document that, there are reasons for it. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the situation where Centers were just routinely paying for flights or the rent once they got here for folks who were staying in places that needed rent paid, um, other amenities. So again, that's an enticement. But really, patient brokering and enticement are kind of just all in the same thing. It's, it's paying directly or indirectly for patients in some way. Yeah. So someone who would benefit from one type of treatment more, but it, but they're getting enticed to go to a different kind of center, they would go there because possibly they can't afford the difference. The but also, why wouldn't, you know, a lot of people just think, well, it's free for me to stay there. Why wouldn't I do that instead? Of course, right. And yeah. finances are a really big issue for a lot of people coming to treatment. So you can see how they're enticed into that very easily. Mm -hmm. and, and it's very difficult to, to tell people Hey, even though you're getting your plane taken care of, is this the right center for you? Right. Yeah. It's hard to separate the financial from the clinical in their minds because financial is such a big issue for people. Well, and people are also desperate yes. when they're getting ready to go into detox in a treatment center. And so are their families who are often the ones you're talking with. Right. But for me, the fact that they're desperate means you have to take greater care. In yes. Not so to take advantage of them. Right, because the coerciveness of that, there's a coerciveness that can be built into those kinds of relationships. I, I talked to you about my own spine surgery, you know, and, and how I was in such pain before that, and I wasn't hearing things, you know, clearly. And so this is what 
the people are often very intoxicated. They're at the end of their rope. Families are at the end of the rope. They're desperate. And so they want to hear something, something that's going to give them hope. And if they hear, oh, my plane's being taken care of and they're going to pay my rent when I get out there, that's a good place. I want to go there, you know, and it's not a good place because if they're doing that, they're doing other things probably to take advantage of your policy, your insurance policy. Mm -hmm. Chances are. Right. So that, that would be one really clear red flag for people. Yes. If they're offering a lot of goodies, then maybe you should look into the treatment side more. Too good to be true, it probably is. Yes. Yeah. 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 So the next one on here is listing theft. Now that sounds like out and out fraud. This is actually a new one to me. I read this for the first time this morning, frankly. I did not know that this was going on, but it says hijacking of Google business or Google maps listings through the suggested edits feature. So unaffiliated individuals can go into an organization profile and change listed phone numbers to reroute calls and online correspondences to other treatment programs or call centers and change listed addresses to deceive patients of the actual location. So you see what's going on. I, I did not know that that was going on. Um, that's a new one, but it makes sense in that there's a lot of creativity around the fraud. There's people finding new ways to do it. So that must be one that's popping up. Well, and hopefully Google will do something to fix that. It doesn't make sense to me that somebody else could go into your profile and change things. Mm, yeah. Kind of scary, really. yeah. Yeah. And then misrepresentation of services. So um, that again, sounds like something that would be kind of complicated because addiction recovery is complicated. It is. It's very complicated. And this is a very big category. So if you just think any kind of misrepresentation is in this category. Um, they talk about inaccurately portraying the services you provide or the status of your accreditation, the types of conditions you treat, the credentials of your staff, all of that. But it, it also goes, so that's misrepresenting to patients quite often, but there's also misrepresenting to insurance companies. So it's like you're going to say false things to the client to sort of induce them. Um, and then you're also going to say things to the insurance companies in a similar way to induce them to pay for the client's treatment. So it's a very broad category of any sort of misrepresentation of service. Could you give an example of that? Yeah, I mean, I think one is just to say, you know, we're a trauma program. People say this all the time. But the thing is, is do you have any independent, like we've got independent assessment of outcomes now. Like we're, we're, we know that our trauma works. We see independent, okay? So we, can, we feel like we can say that. Um, but you can't just say that if it's not true, if your clinical doesn't back it up in some way. So that's just a misrepresentation and entices people to come. And then they don't get their trauma dealt with, in which case they could relapse and then have to go back. So it can be a serious issue. That's just one example of it. Well, and trauma is such a buzzword these days, the last few years. And I remember when you first opened the center five years ago, really just kind of going, well, trauma is underlying all of this addiction. We really need to do it, deal with the trauma first. Yes. And that, you know, that was something quite unique at the time five years ago. And now it seems like everybody's jumped on the bandwagon. And I know there's, you know, trauma-informed yoga, trauma-informed therapy, trauma-informed almost everything. And a lot of what I'm seeing isn't all that trauma-informed. Here's Yes, you're absolutely right. And here's one way that the patient can get behind that is simply ask the treatment center to let them, let the patient speak to former patients about trauma. One-on-one, -on -one, nobody else is present on the phone call. Ask as many questions as you want to that person and about exactly what trauma they had and how it helped or it didn't. And then you're bypassing the people that are misrepresenting and you're going straight to the patients. Assuming that, they're, that those are valid patients, those are actually patients. So there's, there's the one issue there. Yeah, I suppose they could have some people that are pretending to be patients. It happened, totally. Right. Yeah. When I was reading about this, I was a little, um, I mean, certainly dismayed and disappointed. This is not a, a wonderful part of human nature that people take advantage of other people, and especially people who are highly traumatized, which is always the case with addiction, and who are really desperate for treatment. 
and then they get taken advantage of like this. It's it's awful. It's the reason that I'm talking about it. Mm -hmm. It's the reason that I was forming these groups because if you actually are conscientious and you understand what's happening, like it's not just people taking advantage of of insurance policies to get more money. There's a real negative impact on patients who you know are at the worst time of their life, often. So yeah, that's where the passion comes from around this subject. Mm -hmm. Can you say a little bit about the groups? I know you go through a very rigorous accreditation and uh, there's a lot of inspections and it's a prize and it seems like it, it's a pretty good process now. It is. So, we, so we're so we JACO accredited, the Joint Commission on Behavioral Health, um, which is good. It's a gold standard, but it's a gold standard on the clinical side of things or the safety side of things. So what this is important for the public to know, really important, that if a center is JACO accredited, JACO has not audited any of the business or marketing practices of that center. That's important. So if you see JACO, all that that says is that that center has gold standard in terms of clinical treatment, which is good, and in terms of risk and safety management. So making sure that everyone's safe. So that's what you get. But there's nothing about the JACO title that can assure you that the business and the marketing practices of a center are up and up. So that's important to understand. And this is the reason that I started to help form these other organizations, which could fill in the missing piece that JCO wasn't dealing with. So there's two organizations. One is ICOTP. It's a collection of treatment providers that have come together. They know that they're on the up and up. We know who the bad guys are. We want to find out who they are. And we want to help get rid of those folks in any way we can. Um, a lot of what we do is behind the scenes. We don't tell people because we're, you know, in some cases we work with law enforcement. Um, and then the other organization is called ATAC, A-T-A-C. Um, A-T-A-C is really an advocacy group. So it's really, there are a lot of good treatment centers, despite all that we're saying, there's a lot of good ones. Um, and so it's advocating on behalf of those providers and the patients that need to get to those providers so that we're trying to preserve the health insurance issue here so that people actually have good insurance. But when there's so much fraud, the insurance policies just aren't working for people anymore. They're, the premiums are too high. So we're advocating on those issues in terms of what a, what a patient has to pay or what a treatment center needs from an insurance company to, to run. So I'm not as active in attack as I was because what I've as you know, we're growing a new model on the clinical side here. So all, all of my attention has been, been put on this new model of recovery. Uh, but certainly this advocacy is a big part of what I do on the side. Are you starting to see an effect of that, of this work? The bad guys, are they getting scared? Yes, some of them. Yeah. Some of them continue to operate even while law enforcement is here investigating. Um, yeah, we saw, so with the TAC, some really good things that we did, there was a health net audit. Health net is an insurance company here in California. Their policy was paying pretty well for their members and people were defrauding them left and right. So health net audited all addiction treatment centers in, I know California, but other States. And you know, the Kilgore Center was one of the first ones to finally get paid. We, we were the first. They found out that we were on, on the up and up, which is great. Um, but then a lot of other treatment centers either haven't been paid or they got paid late because there was some investigation that had to happen. That was a very important turning point, the health net audit here in California. You started to see things shift right after that so that um, – People who were operating in ignorance, making mistakes, started to educate themselves and correct that. And, but the bad guys just found more um, covert ways to do it after health net. So, yeah, after the health net audit, the, so it's divided in a bit. It was like the guys that were, or the, the centers that were already had the intention to be ethical, but were making mistakes. They started to correct those mistakes. They wanted to find out what was health net so upset about. Let me correct this. It was just mistakes. Um, but then the other side of it is that some of the bad players learned how to 
engage in fraud more covertly so that they wouldn't get caught on the next insurance audit to face it with. Is that something that people could check into or ask? Um, what's the health net audit status if you're in California? Yeah, if a center has not paid by, by health net, you can pretty much assume there's an investigation going on. So you can ask that question, have you been audited by health net and, and have you been paid? Because health net stopped all payment until they learned who the good guys were and then they started paying them. So if that center has not been paid by health nets now three years later, it's, it's probably, you shouldn't go there, frankly. It's enough for you to know there's something going on probably. Private, uh, the privacy violations and HIPAA, I know the rules are for HIPAA are quite strong. So what's going on with the patient privacy? You know, I don't know how, how this totally ties into fraud. I think that this article is trying to make the point, but I think more loosely that people are very, um, well, they're very loose with HIPAA, with privacy laws. In other words, if you're not educated about the law generally, you're probably not going to be educated um, enough on this privacy issue. And so you might be mentioning things publicly that identify patients or whatever. Um, and I guess in some cases, it says they're actually sharing some HIPAA information between centers um, to, to entice patients to get there. Like, they're, I guess that's going on. I'm, I'm not familiar with that. I actually see more that just centers are very loose or ignorant around privacy. And they're just making mistakes left and right in terms of not protecting the confidentiality and privacy of patients. We've made a couple of mistakes when we first got in, just leaving a computer up where an email was up, you know, some an employee did this, and then a client saw it and got on there. Well, immediately, of course, we're going to fix that and make sure that never happens again. So I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about those that are just continually making mistakes and then they're not learning from them and, and trying to protect privacy better. And so insurance overbilling, that seems like a really big topic again. And that's probably where a lot of the real money comes in. So people are, it, it sounded like people are doing all kinds of things. Like they're saying that they have people that they don't even have anymore. I was shocked when in, in the article it said that they're paying people to relapse so that they can get them to come back for another period of time. Right. And that's a different article that appeared in The Fix, the, the online magazine called The Fix. So we can direct people there. And I think the name of the article is... Um, Unethical, let's see here, I wanna make sure people can find this before we talk about it. Yeah, here it is. It's the unethical side of addiction treatment. It's The Fix online magazine, so thefix.com. The article is by Paul Furr, F-U-H-R. Um, so that article mentioned the sort of the shadier stuff. It talked about an NPR segment that reported um, one rehab owner had billed insurance companies for more than 58 million. So this is the kind of stuff that you're talking about here where there was probably paying people to relapse. I don't know if it was in that situation, but they're paying people to use so they can run people back through insurance. And those are some of the more extreme cases. Yes. It's, um, it's appalling. It's very a treatment center would pay someone to relapse so that they could have them come back in for another 90 days or whatever it is. Yes. It's, it's, there's no words for it, really. Yeah. Yeah. So there's other kinds of overbilling that are going on, too. The insurance companies must be spending a lot of money, and the law enforcement agency is spending a lot of money trying to really do this research into how this is going on. Do you think this has been going on for years and years? Yes. I think that... But back in the, here in the States, you know, if you, before we had Obamacare, if you had a pre-existing condition, you often couldn't get your health insurance, right? So that barred a lot of people from getting addiction treatment because addiction was a pre-existing condition. Obamacare lifted that so that people could have access to insurance. Now the insurance companies then started having to pay a lot more just legitimately because people had access to treatment, which we like, but then the fraud on top of that um, certainly came in and has created, as you say, huge expenses in all the different systems, the legal system, 
the insurance system itself, which has a direct negative impact on patients who get a policy now that because of the fraud doesn't pay the provider very well or the premiums are so high or you have a deductible of $10,000. When you see a policy like that, that's pretty much, you can guarantee at least somewhat the result of the fraud in really all of healthcare, but in, on the addiction treatment side. Do you have any examples of things you've heard about that people are billing for? Yeah, overbilling is just what they're talking about here. Overbilling is, okay, let's say someone is scheduled for IOP, intensive outpatient, which is half day. They might bill for a whole day instead, even though the client left at noon. Okay. Or a client leaves treatment on February 1st, but the treatment center continues to bill the insurance company as if the client is still there for a month or two or whatever. That's overbilling. Um, probably the one that most people who've heard about this issue are aware of is the drug screen issue. Um, so uh, there's different names for this, but this is the biggest, I would say the biggest fraud happening in California where um, providers are getting UAs, uh, urine analysis from a patients, and then they are charging really high amounts to the insurance company. It should be much lower. It's just a urine screen, but mm -hmm. sometimes thousand, a thousand dollars per screen charging to the insurance company. And then on top of that, often they're getting these patients from brokers out there. So they're paying for the patient, which is illegal. And then when the patient gets there, they're overcharging on the urine screens to again, build the company. And you can see the problem. It's just so systematic really. Part of the way to address that would be to have caps on what you can charge for things like drug screening, I'm thinking. But the rest of it, you'd almost have to just be auditing. Yeah. How would you know if a patient is left already? Yeah, you have to audit. Yeah, correct. Right. Yeah. And then we're seeing more audits, I think, now. And I don't blame insurance companies for this. Mm -hmm. yeah. they, the insurance companies are not, um, they don't have completely clean hands in this. There's definitely fraud that's happened from insurance companies. Um, where they've misled patients around the benefits that are covered in order to entice them to get the policy, mm -hmm. or they actually outright lie to members on the phone. Um, so they'll tell providers one thing, and they'll tell the members who have the policy something else. And that's fraudulent. So I don't want to make the insurance companies all out to be this sort of innocent player. And there's, just, there's good and bad in that group also, basically. So overall, if you're summing up this problem, what are some things that people could be doing and looking for in order to kind of help assure that they're getting into a good treatment center? What would your kind of summation of that be? I kind of have to put myself in their shoes. If I were going to get treatment, the one thing I would want to do is I would just research. So I would find out whether the place is JACO accredited first, because then I know that the clinical and the risk and safety management is high standard. Um, then I wanna to look to see, of course, if there's any article out there about the center. I mean, some of these centers are being investigated, some there's already charges filed. So if you see an article where there's charges filed, you know, that's information you need to know. Um, ask for, again, patients, talk to patients, former patients. Do you have any patients that I can talk to to ask about your clinical program, your financial procedures, whether they felt like they were treated fairly with regard to finances or if they were, whether you were honest, whatever. Just have that conversation with a couple of people. It's unfortunate that you have to do that, but you really do these days. And then in terms of advocacy um, and changing laws, is there any, any kind of consumer groups that are active in trying to improve the ethics of, of treatment centers? There is, and they're popping up more and more. Uh, you know, I co-founded two of them, but they're really popping up across the nation. There's not yet a concerted collective effort of joining forces, and that's unfortunate because it's fragmented, therefore. So it's like there might be a group in New York advocating for this, and then we're over here in California, but we haven't connected yet. It's, and that's, that's a problem because once we connect, we can then, as a unified front, we can, we can 
contribute to law enforcement's investigation, or we can create new guidelines for the patient across the nation to protect the patient from this, but we're just not there yet. And there's not, frankly, many centers are not involved in advocacy. It just, they have other things that they're focused on, um, which I understand also. So. Well, especially a small center, you don't have a lot of resources. You certainly don't have a staff person that you could send to these groups and get involved in that. It's all kind of on your own time. Yeah, I think the mom and pop shops that are on the up and up are the ones that are um, most negatively impacted by this for that reason. They don't have the resources to, to keep up with the bad guys, <laughs> yeah. So is there anything else you wanna talk about here? I, we've come to the end of those points, but is there anything else you wanna cover? No, I mean, the, the last section that they talk about on that website is just insurance fraud. Um, and they, they sort of talk about how it happens. But the way that they're talking about it here is just a particular kind of fraud. Um, insurance fraud is a huge category of any kind of deception or fraud towards an insurance company or a patient. The one that they're talking about here was a specific fraud scheme that was going on where, so if a patient in Illinois wanted to come to treatment in California, often there was something, um, someone from the treatment center that would sign the person up on insurance. Because the, the idea being that the person was making a permanent move to California, because that's legal, actually. If you move to California, you have a right to get California insurance. So when I first saw that you could actually help somebody get insurance, I saw the problems with that. Because if you don't prove in some way that that client has some intent to live here, then your procedures are so loose that you're essentially engaging in fraud because you know there's there's deception there, right? So what we did is we, we, we just put in place several sort of barriers to that happening. And one is that the, the client had to verify um, under penalties of perjury that they have the intent to move and that they're gonna take some action when they get here to prove residency, which means get your driver's license things like that. And so we built those in. But so this scheme is not happening as much in the, I think people have, but I, it's still going on certainly, but way, way behind closed doors. Well, and it's the closed doors and the secrecy around this too. There's still such a stigma that that probably contributes to the, these, the bad guys operating more freely because yeah. a lot of people don't want to talk about it. And then People who are stung by this probably also don't want to admit that that happened. No, it's, so it's kind of hard for everybody. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think one thing for people to know also is that the, there is something going on where, where centers are actually filtering clients back and forth or even through a system. Uh, so you can actually see there are databases now that show where clients have gone in the system. And you uh -huh. can see that there are many clients who follow the same path through the same detox and then this center and then back to this detox and this center and this center. So you can see that these centers have been working together in many cases, paying money for the patient to, to get to each place. And that's it. And then so those folks who got pulled into that one um, are many of them very angry <laughs> once they found out. So they're not quiet about it actually. Oh, uh, good. Yeah. They're talking about it and going to law enforcement. Mm-hmm. Well, and in something as important as this, especially with the opioid crisis, people die when they don't get the right kind of treatment. And it's not like every treatment is gonna have a successful outcome, but it would be much enhanced if people at least weren't being fraudulent and at least weren't just trying to scam millions of dollars out of people. Yeah, and, and you know, I, I do wanna speak on behalf of those who've just made mistakes because I think that sometimes a treatment center thinks, what's well, a nice thing for me to buy a plane ticket for this person? Mm -hmm. And in some ways it is, mm -hmm. you know? but you have to look at how the law sees that, you know? And so that's really part of the reason that I'm speaking today. I, I don't think there's a lot of hope for the bad actors, frankly. Mm -hmm. There are people out there that are making mistakes that are creating unfair competition too. They're making mistakes and they're not correcting them. And I want to speak to those centers and say, look, you can still get clients without paying for their plane tickets. 
if your if your program is good, people will want to come. You know, and I, I understand the 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 seduction in that of trying to help people, but it's got to really understand how the law works now. So it is illegal to offer those kinds of enticements for people to come. If if for any reason it induced a patient to come, it's illegal. It could be that the patient came for four different reasons. They like the clinical program. They like the area. They like the person they talked to on the phone. And the center bought them a ticket. Mm. Just the one factor. It doesn't matter if there are 18 other reasons. If one of the reasons is, it's, then it's illegal. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. Right. So all of those people with good intentions at least would have... Um, those people can be reached and hopefully the law enforcement will reach the people who, are, who are, are not. Do you have a sense in the industry who the good players are and who the bad ones are? I do. Um, you know, usually the good guys are the ones that nobody just says anything bad about. Everybody sort of knows that they're on the up and up. Um, the bad guys are, you know, there's the ones that are being investigated. Um, and so, you know, because of that, you hear about it in the news. But then there's a lot of just hearsay, and, you know, like such and such treatment centers. It sounds like they're doing this. You can't always trust that information because sometimes centers like to start rumors about other centers. Um, but if you're hearing things like that, I think it's worthy of investigating it. Let's see. Right. That's a, it's shocking to see this kind of fraud in, in such an important area of healthcare. Yeah. And especially since a lot of people haven't don't have good access to, to treatment and the, you know, the insurance companies don't pay for really long enough care. I know when I inter did one of the interviews for the summit, uh, Ken Seeley was talking about five year plans yeah. and how you, you guys are working towards trying to get insurance companies to be realistic about what it takes for someone to recover and to fund that longer term recover like they do for doctors and pilots and things like that. Yeah, that's needed. And of course, you know, that can actually save money for the insurance companies if they start to support a long term recovery, because the let's say the last four years of that five years is not addiction treatment in an inpatient setting. It could be just weekly meetings or just case management or something to give support to that person that can save the insurance companies money because it can ward off or prevent an actual relapse, which costs them more money. And more devastating to clients. Yeah, it would make sense that those things start to happen. And the there's so much um, of a spotlight on the field of, of recovery now because of the opioid crisis that hopefully people are starting to look at things like that going, well, how can we actually help? It's just, you know, the devastating impact on the family. You can't, uh, you can't overstate how horrible it is for them. And so many people have lost their children and friends and partners and parents and yeah it's true and so these two stories are happening at once that's the thing mm -hmm. so the heroin epidemic this story which is a reality sort of not just a story but it's a reality mm -hmm. in people's lives um that story is amping up in the media we're all becoming more aware of it and then the fraud story is is sitting so that's the problem is you have this epidemic in which people need these services more than ever Mm -hmm. And then this going on at the same time. So. Right. So disheartening. Yeah. And they need the legitimate trauma informed treatment that will really help someone to heal what's driving the addiction. Right. Not, not just the kind of two or three weeks at a center and then being sent home. Yeah. And Lynn, I love how you're an advocate for trauma work. And it reminds me another thing that a patient can do because everybody's calling themselves again a, a trauma center now is that you can ask informed questions about that. So who is it that provides the, the, the trauma therapy and what's the methodology? Do you have any independent assessment of outcomes on the methodology as it applies to trauma? Can you show me statistics? Not ones that you worked up, but that the patients um, themselves or an independent party um, did. And then the other thing that you can do is you can ask other questions because it, only certain modalities work with trauma and, you know, certain cognitive ones are helpful, but the body centered approaches, the somatic therapies, 
somatic therapists, things like that, our work is somatic, you would want to ask questions about that because is the, is, does the center even use a methodology that even works for trauma? You know, so that's okay. research those methodologies that they're telling you they use. And if they have any independent outcomes, ask for those. Get all that before you go. Well, and anybody who's been doing trauma work for a while should be able to provide that. They should be able to say, this is the methods we use and this is the results. And you should be able to research the methods. A lot of the people that I've interviewed on Radical Recovery Summit, they've got some pretty good evidence now that these things work. Yes. Yeah. And also just another issue is the credentialing of the person because what I found in this space is that there are therapists who are licensed with many years who cannot work with trauma. They don't know how. Right. And there are other people who have less credentials who have a robust history with working. And I, and I think of you, you're not a, a, as far as I know, a licensed therapist, but right, I'm not. you are so good at working with trauma. And I would send someone to you before I would send them to a host of other therapists. So it's like you have to dig a little bit deeper than just credentials because you have to look at experience and you have to look at the personal embodiment of that therapist. Is that therapist still suffering from a lot of trauma? Has it not been resolved? Right. Have they worked with other patients who can show positive outcomes and don't get don't get sidetracked just on credential credential is important that mm -hmm. there's been training and all that but you really want to look at the experience and the, the skill of the therapist you have to be trauma informed to understand the trauma response and how it shows up in different people in different ways um, and we've gotten fooled at first thinking that a client had a sort of ill intention and then we looked closer and we found out no that's their trauma but I have to say this that even so, a, a patient has to be ready to deal with the trauma. So if you come to a treatment center and you're just responding from your trauma without the readiness to deal with that, that's going to be problematic. Yeah. You may not just be ready, and that's going to be disruptive to other clients if you're not dealing with it. So it's not just that everybody with trauma gets served equally. You, you have to be ready for this work. You know, it's, it's not easy work, as you know. It isn't, yeah. And some of the, the treatment might be might look a little bit different from one person to the next someone who has a more of a freeze response is quite often compliant in groups and not causing any trouble someone right. who has an anger response different story people think they, they beat themselves up not understanding it's oh, a trauma yeah. response. i think it's important for people to understand even just the basics of the nervous system so that they're not blaming themselves for fight flight freeze totally. and and for addiction i mean addiction just it's there for a reason that's how you medicate the fight. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so people don't understand that. They don't even understand kind of the root of it. Yeah. And how are you ever going to heal that? And I suspect a lot of treatment centers don't really understand that very well. Or they don't have, they don't always have people that could really work effectively with people because they don't really get the nervous system. They don't get the, the somatic part of it. Totally. And that's why we're calling it the new model because... Well, in the old model, we feel like there was a lot of not understanding that some unruly clients were actually just having a trauma response. Yes. And so these treatment centers were sort of bearing down on these clients, punishing, judging, yeah. intervening, further traumatizing them. Yeah. Saying, oh, this is conscious behavior. You're just trying to, you're just trying to be bad. And then once we understood what the trauma response was, we're like, we're not going to do that. Right. But still, the client has to be ready. I mean. If yeah. So. Yeah, there has to be some capacity there too. So thank you very much, Scott. Uh, this is such an important topic and I'm glad that you brought forward some of these issues. It'll be helpful for people to know. So what's the last thing that you'd like to leave people with? That there are good centers. That's what I want people to know. And the Killaby Center is one of them, but there are others. There's quite a few. So I just want to, I want to celebrate those centers and have more of them. Um, and I don't want this fraud discussion to deter from that or, or from, from you know, taking our focus off the fact that there are good centers. That's really all I want to say. I just want to, it's not, we're not all bad in this industry. That's what. And the, so to check the clinical accreditation, it's JCO? J-C-A-H-O. It's the Joint Commission on Behavioral Health. That's the. Okay. And HealthNet, one of the questions that they could ask a center is HealthNet. Have they been paid? Yes. HealthNet audited 
about five states here in the West. So it's only going to be relevant if you're coming to treatment in the West. Oh, I see. Okay. California, for example, but you can ask the treatment center, have, were you audited by HealthNet and were you ever paid? And if they say they weren't paid, you should do some more research. California. Right. Okay. Well, great. Well, thank you very much. All right. Thanks, Lynn.